Today marks 95 years since the deadliest school attack in United States history, the Bath School bombing. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, or should I say good afternoon, actually. I'm News 8 Digital Anchor Luke Lasser here from the Wood TV Live Desk. Joining me this afternoon, one of our own, digital reporter Matt Jaworski. Matt, good afternoon. Hey, Luke, how you doing? Good, good, good. So, hey, a largely forgotten massacre. Um, after reading your story here, which is live now on woodtv.com attached to this stream, um, I was I was shocked. I never I had never heard of it. To be completely honest with you, a new documentary surrounding this, a three-part documentary, if that's correct, um, is going to be released here very soon. Tell me a little bit about it. Not the documentary, actually. Let's start with just the history here. Sure. Yeah. So today uh, it's a obviously a somber day for for Michigan and uh, that township, really. But something that's not really understood. So uh, 95 years ago today. Uh, a man detonated a bunch of explosives, dynamite and pyrotol, uh, in the basement of the Consolidated School Building in Bath. It took down um, approximately half of the building, to the stories, uh, and it killed 44 people, including 39 kids. Uh, so technically, it's, it's the deadliest school attack in American history. Um, but it's one that's really not talked about that much, and there are a variety of reasons for that. Um, one, uh, two days after the explosion was actually uh, Charles Lindbergh's flight across the Atlantic and that just dominated headlines across the world. And it kind of overshadowed the bombing a little bit. Um, but aside that point, uh, the producers of the documentary got into this a little bit where it seems like the people of Bath didn't want to talk about it. Um, obviously it's a different time what we have now. Um, the Matt Martin, who's the executive producer on the project that I spoke to about it, um, talked about how, you know, they didn't have therapies and, and to, it was more common at the time to just kind of bury these tragedies and try to move on with their life. I mean, the vast majority of these people were farmers and as, and as hard as it is to move on, you know, losing a child or, and this whole community wrestling with this, they still had to get plants in the ground, they still had to harvest, they still had to milk their cows, all those kind of things. So, so it definitely, it took a while. Uh, it, it took them a while to adapt and uh, leading into the documentary, it's actually been a work in progress for about 16 years now. Um, Matt Martin says this, this was the first uh, project that he ever started. He got his first high def camera in 2005. And uh, this is a story that he just happened to learn about. Um, he, uh, I'm a Michigan native and, and I didn't hear about this until a couple years ago. He heard about it just almost by chance, um, talking about the Columbine school shooting. Uh, and so that really intrigued him. So they did their first round of interviews in 2005. Um, talking, wow. Yeah, 2005, I know, 16 years ago, 17 years ago now, uh, talking to some of the survivors. And he said even then a lot of people were really hesitant to talk about it. Um, it's dredging up a lot of emotion and a lot of emotional scars. Um, but at the same point, you know, these survivors were in their 90s. Mm -hmm. And they were kind of getting to the point where if, if we don't tell our story, no one's going to know it. Uh, so they interviewed a handful of survivors and a bunch of descendants from people who survived the bombing. Um, it, it's a really interesting story. They, they kind of dive into the background of the man who uh, set the explosives, Andrew Kehoe, and kind of trying to explain, not, motivations might not be the right word, but in his mind why he was doing this and just, you know, the, the evil surrounding all of that. Um, so they get into a lot of that and just share, share the story from every perspective of what happened that day. A lot of really incredible detail. You know, I think you had mentioned it there with that generation maybe bottling those emotions up. So I could only imagine just the raw emotion that came from those interviews of talking to those people who you well into their 80s, 90s. Yeah, um, we've, I believe we've lost them all now. Um, Irene Dunham, who is a fantastic story in her own right. She passed away earlier this year. She was 114 years old. Wow. Oh, she that's was, right. She was yes. uh, one of the 10 oldest people in the world mm. and the third oldest American. Uh, she passed away earlier this year, but she uh, didn't go to, she was a senior that year mm. at Bath School, but she had a sore throat and she didn't go to school that day. Wow. Just like a weird thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of incredible. And for her to go on and live to be 114, you know, that's just a huge, I mean, another 94, 95 years tacked on to her life. Uh, she lost her brother in the explosion. Um, a handful of other people, they, they kind of interview, they show a lot of 
um, in the documentary audio recordings. You can see these old Max Maxell tapes mm -hmm. rolling of interviews that were done by other historians and uh, some of the other survivors that, you know, as they're kind of wrapping up the documentary, they're showing their story and then kind of mention how they pass and when they pass and, and that kind of thing. So, yeah, it was definitely, I mean, it, there's a lot in it. The, the documentary goes into some really interesting details, but definitely an emotional story for sure. Ladies and gentlemen, again, this story live now on woodtv.com. It is attached to this live stream here if you're viewing on Facebook. It takes you right over there. You're able to read it there. Matt, one of the things um, that, you know, caught my eye, where, uh, eye there was uh, Kehoe and his explosives. Are you able to, yeah. you know, you, you mentioned it in the story. Could you elaborate on yeah, it's, how he got those and uh, just, you know, how that kind of came about? Because that's really something we don't see today but then it, right. it wasn't too too much out of the ordinary no there were kind of a lot of reasons why looking back on it they had no real reason to be suspicious so in the in the article i, I covered a couple of the topics i didn't really delve into his relationship with his wife and his, his wife's family that was one of the big motivators um one of the main reasons that investigators and historians believe is uh he was having financial issues and he he Kehoe was the school board treasurer and did not support raising taxes to fund this school building. It was, by all intents and purposes, an immaculate building. It was a major investment in the township's future that a lot of people were on board, but Kehoe is not. Um, before Kehoe, so he graduated from Michigan State College, no MSU, mm -hmm. and then moved to St. Louis, Missouri, where he worked as an electrician. Um, at some point, you know, a decade later, he moved back to Michigan, got married, they settled in Bath Township, he was a farmer, um, but he had this uh, background in, in, as an electrician, so in addition to serving as a school board treasurer, he was also kind of like a volunteer handyman. Um, so it was normal for him to be in the building after hours, being asked to come in and work on projects. Um, at the time, farmers also regularly used dynamite. Um, to you know, clear tree stumps, yeah. to help clear land. I mean, this is stuff you could buy at the general store. Hmm. It's so bizarre to think about now, but that's the way things operated back then. Uh, and Kehoe specifically was kind of known as like the dynamite expert. He knew how to use these explosives well and how to wire everything because of his, his background as an electrician. Um, so the historians believe he, he spent days and weeks meticulously planning this. Um, planting, bringing the explosives into the school and planting it, wiring everything together, hiding it up in like the beam so no one, a passerby wouldn't notice anything out of place. Um, in the aftermath of the explosion, you know, police did an investigation to see if he had any accomplices. How, how could we have not realized this was going to happen? And they, uh, you know, focused on the janitor who had worked with Kehoe in some respects, but obviously he's around the building, and they were like, he clearly wasn't involved in this, and there was really seemingly no way to know that this was happening. I mean, it was all very bizarre. It is very bizarre, yeah. especially today with the sales of that, with getting into a school. Uh, that's just unreal. Yeah. Matt, let's take a look real quick here. Again, folks, a story on woodtv.com now. The title, Documentary to Highlight Forgotten Michigan School Massacre. Mm -hmm. Let's dive in a little bit more to the documentary itself. You spoke with, you know, some of the folks involved in that. Mm -hmm. What else were they saying? Uh, this is kind of a, it's been an on-again, off-again project. As I mentioned, they first started in 2005. They actually had a finished cut of the project in 2011. Uh, they are hoping to sell it to uh, History Channel or Discovery Channel, those kind of things. Uh, but they found they didn't really have a home for it. Uh, the producer that I talked to was kind of talking about how, you know, at, at that time reality TV was just completely taking over, and so they didn't really find a buyer. So the project was put on the back burner. Um, they revisited it in 2019. They wanted to expand it and do more. Um, they got more interviews with survivors. So Irene Dunham was actually interviewed twice, once in two, or at least twice, once in 2005, and then again in 2019. Um, it's just bizarre to still have her around. Mm -hmm. um, but they also filmed a number of historical reenactments. Uh, and Martin talked about just how much it's, it was easier to tell the story and make a bigger impact by literally putting faces and, and putting motion to a lot of these, you know, it's mostly black and white photos. You know, uh, one of the quotes I used for the story is he talked about 
they realized they needed to do that when they were filming kids one day, just like kids playing outside. And he was thinking about the kids lost in the bath school bombing. And he's like, these are, they're kids, you know? I mean, the kids a hundred years ago are the same as they are today. They're still, you know, that have that innocence to them. And so he thought, we really need to bring this to life and actually show, you know, to, to create reenactments. So uh, they did a lot of stuff um, with uh, the bombing and the leading up to it. My favorite part was they had just some really cool Model T cars, uh, in- including Andrew Kehoe. They showed a lot of him uh, driving around in his car, and, and his story actually ends at the school once he realizes that the school building didn't completely come down and knew something went wrong. Um, and so he is technically considered the first suicide car bomber. He drove his truck up, he had boxes of explosives in the back of his truck filled with nails and shrapnel. Wow. Uh, he called over the superintendent who, he was adamantly, they, they didn't get along at all because of the tax issue. Mm-hmm. He called the superintendent over, uh, who was kind of like organizing the rescue and then shot into the box to detonate and cause another explosion. So that killed him, the superintendent, and then two more people. So Unreal. Just a, it's a crazy story. Yeah. Well, Matt, anything else, uh, you know, that you'd like to put out there? I mean, part of the reason why I'm a, I'm a Michigan native and West Michigan guy, and so Michigan history always has, you know, been interesting to me, mm-hmm. and the fact that so many people even here don't know this story. So I think that was what first caught my mind, and that's really where the producers are coming from, too. So I know uh, they're putting the finishing touches in the documentary now, some of, like, the audio work and things, and then th- it's their plan to sell it. So they don't have... A contract lined up here for a, a TV network or a streaming platform to carry it, mm-hmm. um, but they hope to have that lined up soon, and then it'll be put out there. So, did they have any kind of timeline of when something like that would happen? No, probably no. sometime this year. Okay, but nothing like firm yet. But. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, again, this story live now on WoodTV.com. Matt, thank you. Oh, how do you doing? Thanks. Appreciate it. Folks, this has been a look at the Wood TV Live Desk. I'm with Matt Jarowski, our News 8 Digital reporter. Our News 8 Digital anchor, Luke Laster. Have a great afternoon, folks.